Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Hendricks, and I am a member of the steering committee for the Lost Souls Memorial Project. I am also a, a officer with the New Brunswick area branch of the NAACP. I'd like to welcome you to our event this evening. In light of all of the activities that are going on in our country today, and the pain it, is, it has caused so many of us, we truly appreciate that you've taken the time to share this hour with us. It also happens to be a beautiful summer evening. And some of you might want to be out enjoying it, but we promise this is a very important event and we thank you for spending the time with us. The primary purpose of this evening is the third recitation, the names of those individuals who were lost as a result of an illegal slave ring that practiced here in the New Jersey area. However, there's some other things we'd like to share with you this evening. Our project manager and fearless leader, Reverend Karen G. Johnston, is going to share with you the history of the project itself and our mission. Crystal Langston, who is our project historian and also the developer of our wonderful educational products, is going to give you an overview of that history. Then Peter Kahn, also a steering committee member, and I might add an original steering committee member, he will tell you what we've been up to since the last recitation of the names in May of 2019. I will be back at the end for a wrap up and tell you about what's coming up next. But first, I would like to introduce the first vice president of the New Jersey Conference of the NAACP and the president of the New Brunswick area branch of the NAACP to bring us an opening message. Mr. Bruce Morgan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to be here with you. My name is Bruce Morgan. I'm president of the New Brunswick area branch of the NAACP. And I am proud to lend our name to the Lost Souls Purple Memorial Project in remembrance of black men, women, children, and even babies who had their lives stolen. These lost souls had their lives stolen by immoral, unscrupulous, and even evil men. Within the last 30 days, the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Rihanna Taylor, and George Floyd, George Floyd, are reminders of the legacy of these evil men. We must honor the lost souls by using their story to destroy the legacy of lies and deceit created by these evil men and prevent any new senseless deaths. We take this time every year to give these lost souls a name so they are not just another nameless person toiling under the thumb of oppression and their dignity as human beings is restored. I hope and pray that our remembrance will comfort the spirit of these lost souls. We pray our remembrance will enable their souls to become the embodiment of the words from the African proverb that says, when death comes to find you, may it find you alive. Thank you for taking time out of your lives to be with us as we pay homage to these lost souls and we'll show you your continued support for the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project. I would now like to introduce from New Jersey's 12th Congressional District, our good friend, the Honorable Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. Good evening, Bonnie. Thank you, thank you. This has been a tough day for me. Um, I started my morning off with members of the, of the Congressional Black Talk Caucus talking about what we're facing in this country right now and listening and, and, and just sort of brainstorming on the things that we need to do uh, going forward here. Thanks, thank you for the introduction, Bruce, and thank you all for being on this call. And thank you for the uh, Law Souls for envisioning this project and for Mayor Brad for inviting me. Look, thank you all. I, I really appreciate this. It's been a tough week. It's just been a tough year. And you know, we spent a lot of time this year talking about the legacy of slavery and its impact on our lives and how it even impacts us to this day. 
And there are things that we're seeing right this moment, just, just this week, that are vestiges of, of slavery, of the dehumanization of African-American people across this country. And so for you to take your time, the time to reflect, the time to support, and the time to recount those who were enslaved illegally in this state and those who perpetuated those illegal acts is what other people and other communities should consider embracing. History is very important to us and we need to be honest with our history. We're beginning those honest conversations and even out of all this devastation and pain that we're experiencing right now becomes an opportunity for us to have even greater discussions, not all only about what it has been, but what will we expect it to be in the future? It is something that we have to work together on. It is something that we need to understand that we're all in this together from the, 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 the COVID-19 that shows no, no discretion in, in who it attacks, even though it's disproportionately attacking the African-American community because of other issues. We're in this together. And either we thrive together or we will sink together. And so what you are doing is commendable. Thank you for being a role model for others. I hope that what you're doing catches on and that other people see it and that you remember our history and to respect those who've been impacted by slavery and even by just the succession of uh, disparities arising out of the policies and practices in this country will make us stronger together. God bless you. Thank you for your work. And I pray that everything you dream this project to be becomes a reality. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. We appreciate your well wishes on this dream and your support for making it happen. We'd like to share with all of you um, a few minute clip of some of the past two years of what the project has done.
we at the Lost Souls Project want to express our deep gratitude for Congresswoman Watson Coleman's participation this evening, along with other state and local elected officials and public servants. And this includes New Jersey, New Jersey Assemblywoman Nancy Pekin, from whom you will hear later, as well as cameos from East Brunswick Township Councilor Sharon Sullivan, East Brunswick Mayor Dr. Brad Cohen, and Middlesex County Freeholder Shanti Nara. I am Reverend Karen G. Johnston, the Minister of the Unitarian Society in East Brunswick and a proud member of the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project. The Lost Souls Project was established in the fall of 2017, responding to the history of a slave ring run by a corrupt Middlesex County judge in 1818, a judge who abused his power, deceived, and stole scores and scores of both enslaved and free African Americans, sending them into permanent slavery in the Deep South, lining his own and his family's pockets in the process. The project was established to uncover this whitewashed history to raise community awareness and to build a public memorial so that the people who have come to be known as the lost souls would never again be forgot. So that we would fulfill our moral obligation to remember them back home was founded to be a collective act of liberatory memory. Our intention in pursuing this mission is always, always to center the lost souls and their experience over that of the corrupt judge or the network of white men and some white women who made this heinous act possible. Our intention is always, always to ensure that the perspective of members of local black communities are centered in the process and in the project. You will hear more about the history that our diligent public historian Crystal Langford will be sharing with you later in the program. Bits and pieces that have been scattered across time and across academic literature we are bringing together, working ceaselessly to bring to light, revising as necessary, always with integrity in as coherent a manner as possible. Some of what you hear tonight is shocking, revealing a network far more reaching than we even knew just last year when we did our recitation of names then. This is our third recitation. We have committed ourselves to the solemn act of reciting those names of the lost souls for whom we have become the stewards and tonight for whom you are their cloud of witnesses. You honor the ancestors by being here. The recovery of these names, not just names, but lived lives is an ongoing process. And we are so honored to have you be a part of it tonight. The actual recitation tonight will happen in two parts and, and in each part there are times when you will hear a chime ring. Please know that this chime represents a lost soul we have reason to believe existed but whose name we have not yet recovered. A solemn act of liberatory memory made more solemn in this fragmenting time of pandemic, impacting all of us in so many ways, but truthfully not impacting us all equally. We express our deep gratitude to those people who risk their health and their very lives to safeguard all of us in the midst of this viral threat and those who are working relentlessly for a trustworthy vaccine. Yet we cannot go without acknowledging that yet again, 
a scourge that impacts our society does so disproportionately devastating communities of color at higher rates with black folks dying from COVID-19 at twice the rate of white people here in New Jersey. With all this in mind, I invite us now into a moment of silence. One last note, as you hear the cadence of the litany of names of the lost souls, it must not be lost on you. It must not be lost on us. That the cadence of the modern names lost to the violence of white supremacy insinuated so deeply in our society into our systems, into our institutions, the cadence of a too long litany of names, the most recent of which are George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Jamar Clark, Eric Gardner, Philando Castillo, Walter Scott, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Oscar Grant, Rekia Boyd, Michael Brown. When you hear the lost souls of two centuries ago, do not miss the echoes of these stolen black and brown bodies today. Peter, 15. Simon, a free man. Margaret Colvin, a free woman. Sarah, 21, and her daughter. Diana, age seven months. Hagar, 29, and her children. Rhoda, age 14. Augustus, age four. Mary, age two. Flora, 23, and her daughter, Susan, seven months. Harry, 14. James, 21. Elmira, 14. George, 16. Susan Watt, 35. Moses, 16. Lydia, 18. Betty, 22. Patty, 22. Bass, 19. Christine, age 27, with her two children. Dinah, nine years old. Dorcas, one year. Clarice, 22, with her son, Hercules, one year old. Bob, Rosanna, Claus, and with child Rosino, Jeanette. Charles, Elias, Robert. Lita, 21. Dorcas. 16. 
Sam Johnson, 32. Margaret, 21. Jane, 25, with her four-year-old son, John. Mary Davis, 23. Phyllis, 25, with her son, Charles, age one. Jack, 16. Harvey, 22. Frank, 21. Hester, 18. Peter, 21. Susan Sylvie, 30 years, with her son Jacob, 18 months old. Betsy, 22. Jonas, 16, noted as a free person. Sam, 16. William, 22. Henry, 21. Amy, 22. Samuel, two years old, and his mother Judah, 26. James, 22. Sam, 32. Hannah, 16. Nancy, 22. And her son, Joseph, just two days old. Peter, 17, a free person. Hannah, 14. Jack Daniely, 21. In 1818, corrupt Middlesex County Court Judge of Pleas, Judge Jacob Van Wickle, kidnapped nearly 200 free and enslaved Blacks and sold them into the Deep South and permanent slavery. It is through the dedicated work of the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project that we're learning the names and stories of these men, women, and children. In particular, I want to thank the Unitarian Society, the Bruns New Brunswick NAACP, the Rutgers University NAACP, the New Jersey chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, and the Council for the Humanities for their efforts to memorialize these individuals. In a true spirit of community, folks in East Brunswick and from across Middlesex County have come together in recognition of how important it is to remember this dark part of our history. It takes courage to recognize our past mistakes and wrongdoings, but doing so is the first step in addressing and ultimately healing the damage done. It is also the first step in ensuring that they never happen again. I look forward to the construction and opening of a memorial to honor these many men, women, and children who were robbed of their freedom. It is a just and respectful way for us to continue to learn and remember their stories. Your work will make sure that these individuals are never forgotten. We thank you for your dedication and are honored to join you tonight in the third resuscitation of their names. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Crystal Langford. I am a doctoral candidate of education at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. 
I joined the project as an instructional designer, uh, creating the educational resources for the Lost Souls Memorial Project. As I approach this task, recognizing that I'm a descendant of an enslaved people. As an African-American woman of Haitian descent, a wife and a mother, I am obligated to honor, to celebrate, and to recognize the existence of the lost souls. As part of my training as a historian, it is inculcated within me to elevate the voices which have long been silenced. This project actually gave me the opportunity to center the voices of African Americans, men, women, children, and as, as you heard, babies, whose hopes were smothered, their dreams stolen, their lives destroyed, and their futures obliterated. Like many of you, this catastrophic epic was unknown to me. However, as I was developing the educational materials, I became engrossed with the historical narrative of, about human erasure. So with the foundation laid by historians James Gigatino, Francis D. Pingian, uh, Calvin Shermerhorn, and scholar Jarek Drake, I was actually able to create a pretty comprehensive image of the family business of human trafficking. This historical um, work, this investigative work is actually ongoing. So to maintain the integrity of this work that we're doing and to dignify the lost souls, we will continually um, update our website as new information is actually unearthed and verified. What I put together for you is a snapshot of a slave ring that Middlesex County uh, Judge Jacob Van Wickle was a part of. And just to be clear, the judge, what he did was he tapped into an already existing infrastructure of slave trafficking, recognizing the possibility to reap financial reward from this practice he orchestrated uh, the Van Wickle slave ring with his family and political networks. While he is a culprit of this story, our sole objective is to remember the breath, the bodies, and the lives of every lost soul to this horrendous act. Lost to this horrendous act. Thank you. One of the most egregious acts against New Jersey's Black population occurred in 1818. Government officials who held offices of public trust exploited a series of laws that were put in place to not only protect the rights of the enslaved, but also guarantee that their children would one day be free. One of the chief architects of the slavering that took place in New Jersey was Judge Jacob Van Wickle. He served as a judge on the Court of Common Pleas in Middlesex County, and he was also a resident of present-day East Brunswick. He, along with his brother-in-law, Charles Morgan, also a government official for the state of Louisiana, concocted a scheme to secure as many enslaved Blacks, or just Blacks, period, as um, possible to man or till the grounds on Morgan's um, newly acquired plantation in Point Coupe, Louisiana. See, Charles Morgan, because of the Southern um, economy, he noticed that to secure an enslaved person or to purchase an enslaved person would be costly. And because of the laws in New Jersey that you know, guaranteed freedom to the, um, to the enslaved, we have slave masters who, again, no longer saw use for their slaves. Again, the economy in the North is also changing as well. So as a result, plantation owners don't really have a need, um, per se, for their enslaved persons, their property. Once that plan was in place, they tapped into their networks. 
their family circles, as well as their political circles. Considering the judge was well aware of the laws, he knew that Charles Morgan would be prohibited from removing any enslaved persons out of the state, even if they gave their consent. So what he did was he planted his son, Nicholas Van Wickle, as the middleman to mediate that transaction. Another person of interest is um, the, uh, the eighth governor of New Jersey, Isaac H. Williamson. And the reason why he's important is because of his connections to the New Jersey um, jail system at that point in time. With the with Africans and African Americans in the state, their status, they always have to prove their status. So we had um, African Americans who lived or work in close proximity of um, the enslaved population. So if an enslaved person had to go to the store or you know to the market, they probably sometimes have to you know walk through or pass through um, small pockets of black communities. And we have one actually, um, it's called Half Penny Town in New Brunswick, which was actually a, a black community. So you had enslaved people having to walk through um, certain communities. But we also had free people. So if the free person was approached by a slave catcher, they would have to prove their freedom. And if they couldn't prove their freedom, then they would be imprisoned. The prison allowed the a slave master 10 days to retrieve their um, property. After 10 days, if that person wasn't picked up by their slave master, then they would be placed on an auction to be, um, to, you know, for purchase. So considering the governor had access to the, the jail system, when, J, uh, when J, the, the judge, uh, he actually secured or acquired some um, slave persons. And, I'm sorry, he actually acquired some persons, black people, from the, the jail. Also of um, importance or significance is the role of the collector of the port. In other words, modern day um, US customs, a patrol agent, right? So these are the connections that Judge Jacob Van Wickel had. Um, so with the collector of the port, that person being in the place that he is, he's in or the position that he's in, right? It allows for a smooth transition um, across the seas. So again, once those, everyone was in place, right? Everybody knew their role. Um, then we see the process actually play out. However, the type of people that would be captured or taken, sold south, um, would be approached differently, so to speak. So we had individuals who were responsible for soliciting slave uh, plantation owners who um, they would encourage to sell their enslaved persons. Then you had um, people who were responsible for kidnapping, right? So with New Jersey law, right? So the slave masters who had young children in their possession still were able to make money off of the labor of that child. So they would bound them out. They would send them out to work. So you would have individuals who, young children, who would go to um, work you know, for someone else in Philadelphia or, you know, nearby area. And sometimes those kids got kidnapped. And um, we also had individuals who are responsible for approaching freed Black people and, you know, inquire about their work status and exploit that, right? Exploit that um, their destitute situation, right? Because of the racial climate that exists, a lot of Black people had difficulties securing employment. So they took advantage of that, that vulnerability. 
So once we have these enslaved people and these free people and these kidnapped people um, together, what happened? Would, what would happen is that they would bring them to uh, Van Winkle's home, which is actually um, on the if, if we if you would like to visit it or just to get an idea, it's currently a power substation on 121 Main Street in East Brunswick. Well, that's where his house sat, and that's where the enslaved people and the freed people and the kidnapped children would be brought to this um, to this home where the judge and another judge, because the law required that two judges certify consent um, or examine the, the enslaved person's desire to leave the state. So this is where they would be brought. And the judge would ask some questions again to verify that they willingly want to leave the state to go work in the South, the Deep South. What's interesting about that is that we had young children as young as two days old who the judge would take as assent or consent or affirmation a simple cry. So once the cargo um, it was in place, so once the judge signed a certificate of removal saying that yes, these people agreed to go, um, then this cargo would be taken to um, the dock in Perth Amboy loaded on a vessel, a smaller vessel, and then transported to a larger vessel to um, make their way, well, larger vessel in Sandy Hook, and then make their way to Louisiana. The people in Louisiana um, were excited. Again, this is a booming economy, right? So plantation owners are, you know, becoming wealthy off of the the labor of the enslaved. So to secure more people to till the land was a win for them. However, we did have states in the North that um, was outraged about what was taking place. So because we had a lot of kidnappings in Philadelphia and Maryland, we see an outcry, right? Saying to hold these people who are participating in the slave trade accountable. We see um, fathers crying about their children who's been um, kidnapped. We also have the state of New Jersey, right? Individuals in the state of New Jersey, citizens who are challenging this practice. Of interest or of significance is 100, 103 citizens of Middlesex County who actually successfully petitioned the courts, I'm sorry, not the courts, petitioned the state legislator um, to put an end to this and hold anyone who participates in this humane, inhumane act accountable. What I have before you is the, uh, a timeline of the laws, the corresponding laws, um, as well as the departures. And <clears throat> the reason why I'm presenting this is to show you that although the law was put in place, we still had attempts um, with, with that fifth departure. However, I want you to really pay close attention to the departures because this is where we lost our souls. We lost residents, we lost citizens, we lost family members, we lost community members, we lost neighbors, we lost friends. The first departure would take place um, in March and would arrive in May, on May 22nd, 1818. Our second departure would depart on May 25th on the Sloop Thorn. July of the same year, we would see a third departure on the Bliss. Our fourth departure would take place in October um, on the Shohari. And then our fifth departure actually would take place on land. And the reason why we see this attempt across land is because of the law that was passed that held anyone participating in the slavery accountable. 
So the government had their antennas raised on the waterways because that's the way a lot of the um, slave, the smuggling of enslaved persons actually took place. So we would see an attempt across land in Philadelphia. However, it is important to note that because of the society in uh, Philadelphia, they, would, they, they were on high alert for anyone transporting um, enslaved people or a large group of black people, for that matter, across the state. However, with that, we know of um, at least 180 lives that were transformed forever as a result of this heinous act, this criminal venture. Jude, no age noted. Caroline, 18. Anne, 18. Jeanette, 12. Mose, no age noted. George, 35. Kane, 22. Frank, 21. Lewis, 22. Elijah, 31. Mary, 27. Law, 21. Susan, 23. Charles, 43. Pettis, 14. Jane, 23. William McClare, 25. Jaffe Manning, 21. Robert Cook, 17. Ben Morris, 22. Sam Prince, 19. Sam Peter, 30. George Phillips, 18. James Thompson. Edward Gilbert, 22. Dan Francis, 20. James, 15. Charles, 19. Susan Wilcox, 36. Nellie, 18. Betsy Lewis, 28. Jane Clarkson, 23. Elisa Thompson, 21. Jane Cook, 15. Ann Moore, 29. Julian Jackson, 21. Jane Smith, 33. Peggy Boss, 21. Mary Harris, 21. Mm -hmm. 
Sally Cross, 20. Rosanna Cooper, 22. Mary Simmons, 18. Hannah Jackson, 18. Hannah Krieger, 18. Harriet Silas, 15. Fanny Thompson, 14. Elizabeth Ann Turner, 16. Susan Jackson, 20. Hannah Johnson, 20. Hannah, 18. Kane, 22. Jack, 22. Lewis, 22. Peter, 14. Frank, 21. Caleb Groves, 50. John, 21. Collins, 35. Othello, 16. Joseph Hendricks, 19. Jane, 23. Susan, 21. Lena, 38. Samuel. Henry. Violet. Lydia, 22. With her daughter. Harriet Jane, age three. Anthony Fortune, 21. Phoebe, 21, a freed woman. George Bryant, 18. Eliza, 19. Rachel, 22, and her daughter. Regina. Age six weeks. We have been busy in spite of the coronavirus. The New Jersey Council for the Humanities has awarded the project a second incubation grant to develop plans for the memorial. We are grateful to Dr. Karen Berkowitz, the council's executive director for her support and for the support of the council staff. A grant from the Magyar Bank Community Foundation has also been helpful. Orion Concepts has done a fine job in developing our website, which recently went live from sources with material from sources uncovered by the project. The 1619 project of the New York Times Magazine focuses attention on the central role of chattel slavery has played in the creation and development of the United States. It's beginning in 1619 with the first arrival here of a ship's cargo of slaves is the beginning of our country's original sin. The effects lie at the core of many of our present day problems. As part of the 1619 project, Dr. Ann Bailey described the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project in an essay on slave auction sites an essay accompanied by Daniel Bauman's impressive photographs. As we continue to raise awareness, we are attracting national attention. On a cold winter day of heavy rain and wind, we gave a presentation at the Elizabeth Public Library. The Reverend Johnston, Crystal Langford, and I spoke to over 40 brave souls who came out in spite of the miserable weather and several committee members provided logistics. The audience was clearly deeply engaged in the presentation and in the discussion that came with it. If I may add something of my own here, I am of Jewish background. In the summer of 2017, before the Lost Souls project began, my wife and I visited friends in Frankfurt, Germany. 
While there, we visited the graves of Dr. Carl Kahn, a cousin of my grandfather, and his wife, Jenny. Coincidentally, my wife is also named Jenny. Dr. Carl was a decorated veteran of the German army in World War I and a prominent civic figure in Frankfurt. Nevertheless, the Nazis revoked his license to practice medicine. They took his house, and after a while, they sent him a letter telling him the date on which he would be deported, along with his wife. Rather than be sent to a death camp, they committed suicide. On their gravestones is the inscription in Hebrew, they liberated themselves in death. There are many such gravestones in the Jewish cemetery in Frankfurt. While racial bigotry persists, I am not safe. None of us are free, while any of us are not. We appreciate all of you spending this time with us. Um, we hope that you learned something uh, important about the history of our great state. Uh, you've heard a lot of very important information about what we have been doing. I'd like to share with you that our work is not done. Our work is ongoing. So what you're seeing on your screen now is if you have the wherewithal and the time and you'd like to join us, please feel free to do so. May I remind you that we are 100% volunteer organization. So uh, we will be respectful of your time and your efforts. In the coming months, the focus of the committee will be in several areas. We're going to be connecting with historians in Louisiana so that we can bring to bear the history of the souls when they arrived in Louisiana. We are also planning for the design and building of the memorial. And with that, of course, is much needed fundraising and applications for grants. So if you have experience or time and you would like to join our efforts, please feel free to do so. When you visit our wonderful website, you'll learn more information. You can also learn uh, and be able to contact us and understand more about who we are and what we are hoping to accomplish. So um, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that there were three individuals working behind the scenes that you didn't get to see that supported this program for us today. Rich Cordone, a member of the Universalist Church who has been our, our Zoom tech, thank you very, very much. Joe uh, Rosado of Something to Say Media who put together uh, the uh, recital of names for us in that moving tribute, we thank him very much. And Arissa Barnett, we thank you for supporting us in this Zoom program very much. And I should note that Arissa is the daughter of our Crystal Langford. They, they are a wonderful family and the next generation that's coming behind us. So we will keep the chat room open after the conclusion of the event. If you feel free to stick around and chat, several of us will be here. But at this point, the Lost Souls Public Memorial Steering Committee would like to say, Thank you for joining this evening, and we hope that you strongly consider joining our effort. Thank you for joining the third recitation, The Lost Souls. 2020, a very special year indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you on behalf of those whom we're trying to remember. Thank you and be safe. Thank you for taking part in this collective act of liberatory memory. Thank you for the generosity of your time. Thank you for all that you do to bring justice in the world. On behalf of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, the New Jersey chapter, I'd like to thank you for those of us who are currently here and for those that are coming behind so that they understand on whose shoulders we stand. <laughs>